Uh, good afternoon, my name is Marissa. I am with New Lenox Fire District. And today's speaker is Susie Lytle. She is with the Forest Preserve District of Will County. And she's gonna be talking to us today about uh, monarchs and milkweed. Milk right? Yes, yeah. Uh, so go ahead and welcome her and we'll get started. Awesome, thank you everyone. I'm happy to be back. I, if you remember, I think it was just last year we talked about native plants and some plants that you should be a little worried of, of like the poison ivy and the parsnip and stuff. And when they brought me back like, well, what else can we talk about? And one of my favorite topics is monarchs and milkweed. It's kind of a big deal these days and we'll get into why. Uh, a little bit about myself. I've been with the Forest Preserve District of Will County for 10 years now. Um, and I just recently moved to different nature center. We purchased Hidden Oaks Nature Center and Hidden Lakes Trout Farm in Bolingbrook. Um, in February, and so my job has been getting that nature center kind of converted. Yeah. Where is that? Um, it's right off of um, Boughton Road. You know, when you go to the, like the IKEA, you just keep going down, <laughs> and we're smack dab in the middle. Oh, you're way out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you know Wallen Lake, Wallen Lake is kind of the most north lake of Will County, and then we are just south of that. So we got this brand new facility. It is a lead platinum green building with solar panels on the roof. Uh, the lakes have different, uh, four different ponds you can fish out of and we're gonna build a bait shop there. So a lot of new exciting things happening with the north zone of the district. So, but on top of that, I do lots of things. So I work at the Nature Center. I come and do presentations for different groups like yourself. And then you were mentioning, I'm also the host of The Buzz, which is our monthly nature TV show that the district uh, puts together. So we cover lots of things, we're in season three. So we cover everything from monarchs to different preserve highlights, to different bike rides and trips you can take, to the different wildlife too. You're talking about the eagles and the nests, we have babies, and it's just always so fun to show what we have in Will County. So with that, let's talk about our monarchs. And what we're gonna talk about today is how to identify monarchs. There are some lookalikes. We'll go through their life cycle, get you back into like your second grade when we learned all of this, um, talking about their migrating and the different generations, and what is the big deal? Because you'll probably hear about monarchs and milkweed a lot these days. How we can help them, learning about what milkweeds are, and then the last thing is raising monarchs, some best practices. And if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hands and we can explore more on what you have thoughts about. So the monarch lookalikes. There's a few on this page. Uh, we have the painted ladies up at the top. They're very small, and to me, they're more pink than they are orange. And then down the bottom, you have the queen uh, butterfly. They are still smaller than the monarch, bigger than the painted ladies, and they're like a dull orange. So when you think of a monarch, it's very bright and vibrant and bold. Queens are gonna just be like, something's off there. And they're missing some of the patterning, but again, if you saw it flying in a prairie, it would be very easy to confuse it. And then the Viceroy, it is missing. Let's see if my, does that show up? No, it does not. Uh, they have this bar on their bottom wings. Monarchs do not have that. These are all gonna be smaller. The monarch is gonna be the biggest. Now, any ideas why there would be lookalikes? What makes monarchs like so popular that you would wanna look like one? Yeah, they do not taste good to predators, and that's because of the milkweed. The milkweed plants are their host plant. So the caterpillars only eat the milkweed, the butterflies only lay their eggs on it, and by eating that milkweed, they're getting toxins in their body, and they're actually poisonous to predators. Now, I have still seen a chipmunk snatch it up and eat it, and they're fine, but I imagine it just tastes really uncomfortable. So all these other butterflies are like, I see what you did there, and they're gonna mimic it, so predators leave them alone too. Now, how to identify a male from a female? Do you notice anything different about those wings? There's a slight change. Yeah, there's two dots on the bottom. So up here on this top monarch, you'll see a dot here and a dot there. That is a male monarch, and those are scent glands, and they are there to attract the ladies. So they smell so sweet, and ladies will come there, and they'll go on a date and start the life cycle. Now, people always ask me, like, well, how old is this? I was like, oh, how old is an insect? How, do you, how can you tell? Um, monarchs go through, and butterflies in general, can go through a lot 
in their life cycle. So when they're first new, they're very bright and they're bold and they have those scales on their wings. So that's why you might hear people like, don't actually touch their wings because our fingers can actually take those scales off. So you can look up real close, that's what they look like, the little, almost like a roofing pattern. And then within their lives, they can go through spider webs, they can get stuck by thorns, um, weather can just be really battling to them. So when they get older, their scales start kind of falling off, and you'll see in that bottom picture, they're kind of gray and dark, and that's when they're towards the end of their life. And you'll see their wings are ripped up. So you can kind of tell, like, okay, this is a really fresh-looking monarch. It must be new in its adulthood versus, okay, it looks a little like it's seen some things. <laughs> this one may be on its way out. All right, so to get to the life cycle, they start with an egg, they go to a caterpillar, they do a chrysalis into an adult. The whole process takes about a month, give or take. Um, the adult butterfly will actually live two to like six weeks, and then there's different generations, which we'll get into. But a normal generation, that butterfly will live four to six weeks. That last generation that goes to Mexico can live for six months, which is just nuts that like one butterfly doesn't, the other one does. Crazy. Uh, so each phase too has give or take some particular days. The eggs will take three to five days. The larva is 11 to 14. After this, I kind of keep like 12 in my mind because the chrysalis is like eight to 14. So that's how long they'll stay in those states until they're ready to be a butterfly. Now what's interesting that I learned in my adult life, you know, I think of the hungry, hungry caterpillar and like, sure, I know it eats and I know it grows and I know it turns into a butterfly, but did you know how tiny they start? So when the egg hatches, that caterpillar is the size of an eyelash. It is just like the tiniest thing. If you squint, you can see the little stripes on it. And then it will start eating and it actually molts its skin as it grows. So it just kind of takes off that one sweater so it can grow into a bigger one. So you might see little skin molts around. Then it gets bigger and bigger. The biggest they get is about the size of your pinky. And then when they're ready, they go to the highest point they can find, turn their bodies into a J, and they do kind of like little sit-ups, getting their body ready to turn into that chrysalis. And even that to me was nuts when I saw it in person. Like it's not just an automatically like beautiful, perfect chrysalis. They like wiggle and wiggle and they have to take off their caterpillar skin and underneath is all this green and then eventually kind of squishes and gets to that like ideal chrysalis that we all know. And then after that uh, time period, that 12-ish, 14-ish days, the chrysalis will become see-through and you'll see the butterfly in it, it will open up and at that point, it's still a little wet and juicy. So they need some dry out time. All their fluids are in their main like body here and they have to pump their wings to get all the blood and everything in those wings and then they can fly away. So even though they made it to adult life, they can still be very vulnerable from predators eating them at that stage. Yes? How, do you, how different does a adult caterpillar look compared to a tomato worm? Good question. So the tomato worms are those big juicy ones too. The monarch caterpillar has those stripes. So it's black, yellow, and white. Where the tomato hornworm are pretty much all green. They have some dots on them, but generally they're green. They even have, they're called like hornworms. So they even have like little spikes on them. Um, same kind of size and, you know, gushiness. If you touch one, it's like, oh, <laughs> that's a little squishy. But the patterning is going to be different. And same thing with that monarch butterfly. Those caterpillars have those striking colors to say, don't eat me because I'm eating toxin. <laughs> so we will not do good things for you if you're a predator. And another fun fact about um, the adult butterflies, they will lay a single egg underneath a leaf of a milkweed one at a time. Now they can lay up to 400 eggs one at a time. That is a lot of work for that mom. And out of that 400, there could be a chance that only eight survive. So that gets us to the point of like, huh, okay, only eight out of 400. Life might not be as easy as we think for these little guys. So on our caterpillars, you can see the different stages. And I know this picture is up and you're far away, but can anyone count how many caterpillars they see in this picture? Okay, here, guess a four. Anyone else have a guess? Four, 
four or more. <laughs> Right, 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 the size of an eyelash. So there is one that's the size of an eyelash, and that's in the middle of this picture here. That's the little guy. And then I would say this is the, mm, another, another few days, a toddler, and then we've got like a middle schooler, and then this is the big high schooler ready to change. So I would say there's four in this picture. I know this little thing looks like something, but I don't think that's it. And you can see like their little chews. When they're little, they just like, sometimes they can barely break through the leaf. It's really cute. And as they grow, then they just eat and eat and eat and eat. Now, I hear this a lot. Chrysalis versus cocoon. What is the difference? So it's all the same stage. You may also hear the word pupa being thrown out there because butterflies are not the only ones that go through this life cycle. Beetles do it, dragonflies do it. Um, so there's just different names for different animals. So a chrysalis is what a butterfly does. If you open that chrysalis, the butterfly is in there and it's goo and it's changing and it's doing things. A cocoon is what moths do. And moths have a pupa that are, is inside kind of a tent. So they get plant fibers and make themselves this little hairy, I don't know, hoodie, if you will. And then they are actually in there hard, ready to change. So just difference in species. Moths do cocoons, butterflies do chrysalis. And with those chrysalis, Again, mind blowing from a caterpillar to a butterfly. How do they remember all this information? There was a study done that they did little mild shocks to the caterpillars in response to like a particular smell. And then when it went into the chrysalis, they can do like a little x-ray. So you have the red is their like guts and then all the blue is like their nerve system. And it's all goo in there, but there's really, really like little Lego blocks that are piecing together their bodies. So there is things happening in there to rearrange, to make the butterfly. And when the butterflies emerge, they reacted the same way the caterpillars would with those smells. So somehow they remembered their life as a caterpillar, even though they've transformed into this whole nother butterfly thing. So this, the studies are just, Phenomenal. And this is where it gets important when we're talking about helping them or raising them because they are also getting the genetics and the mind map of how to migrate. So there's different generations and the great, great grandchild has to go to Mexico. And somehow through all that DNA and all that changes, that map continues through the genetic line. So it, to me, it's just like my mind is blown. Crazy how that can happen. So I talked about these migrating mig uh, generations. So we don't have the same butterfly in the summer that makes it to Mexico. There's kind of four to three different, um, I guess, generations, you know, grandfather down. So you can see this is our flyway. There's another flyway in California. We have this kind of Midwestern one and ours go down to Mexico. And the first group uh, stays there, like I said, for the six months. They overwinter there. Come spring, they lay eggs. That's the other thing. Their bodies are like, we're not gonna lay eggs yet. We gotta wait until over winter. So how they like turn that off, crazy. So they lay their eggs and then the next generation goes up a little further, lay their eggs, the next generation will hang around, lay their eggs and then that last one, boom, goes back down to Mexico. So here's that just in another like month form because people now are like, well, what generation do I have? So this breaks it down by what generation goes into what months. Now it really depends where you live on this too, because if you live in Texas, you're gonna have that first generation where we probably get the second or third. So in December through February, we have them in Mexico. March through May, you have the first generation. Then second, third is kind of in that summer. By August, now you're getting the six month butterflies that need to make it to Mexico. And just some interesting facts, it takes 3,000 miles to do this journey. They fly about 50 to 100 miles per day, and it does take about two months to get down to Mexico. There'll be tens of thousands that cluster together to stay warm. So you'll see these like 
little roosting huddles in the trees. And even in our forest preserves, we saw them at Hickory Creek Forest Preserve in Mokina, that when they migrate, it wasn't as large as this, but once they see each other, like, okay, let's huddle together for warmth. So in our forest preserves, around the fall, if you think August, September, you could see this kind of behavior even in our trees. And then uh, this is the only butterfly to make a two-way migration. So there are some that might ma migrate to a warmer weather. Dragonflies, like the uh, green, the blue darner, can migrate. But this is the only one that comes back. And then, like I said, there's an eastern population and then a western population that travels in California. Ours go to Mexico. Now, what's the big deal? This is the map that kind of started the, oh, we should do something. So they measure in Mexico how many acres these butterflies cover. So they're not individually counting every butterfly, but they're counting how many trees are swarmed by these butterflies. And at the very end here, you'll notice really high and it just starts getting lower and lower and lower. So in 2013 to 14, it was at an all time low. And it was um, calculated that 80% of the population was gone. And they were saying within like my lifetime, they would be extinct if we did not do anything. So it's just really interesting. I talked to people like, well, yeah, I saw them everywhere. When I was growing up, I saw them everywhere. And I did not. I did not see them. I barely see them now sometimes. So that's when uh, different organizations kind of got in to help. You'll hear a lot about the milkweed and more of what you can do. But it's not all doom and gloom. I hate ending on a negative note. Uh, since then, we've really put in some more efforts that we'll talk about, and now we're raised up. So the la last data they have was 2018 to 2019. So I'm assuming with COVID, the data hasn't been tracked as well. So I, this is the most latest uh, graph I've seen. And this line on this chart is where they want the population to be to keep it steady. Because in any animal populations, you're going to have kind of this up and down um, carrying capacity. You know, it's a great year for resources. They had a lot of babies. Now there's not as many resources and it just goes down. So that is normal, but we need it to be at this number for it to continue at that number. So it's really good. Things are happening. You can see that's upticking. Um, I'm curious to see what the new data is because in the last few years, I've been not seeing as many, but maybe it, they're just doing other things. I don't know. So again, okay, they're endangered, we got it, or they're in trouble. Why do we care? Why save this bug is sometimes what I hear. And what's important to note, and I say it all the time, is that everything in nature is connected. And there's a food web, not necessarily a chain, but a web that everything is connected. So these butterflies are the poster child, not only for them, I mean, they're pretty, people like butterflies, they don't sting, they don't bite, but there's tons of other pollinators and insects that are in the same boat. So if we save the monarchs, in turn, we save all these other insects as well. Um, they are also indicators of a healthy ecosystem. If we have butterflies, that means we have native plants, that means we have other animals, so that's a good sign. If we have those, again, that habitat's just stronger. And a lot of things eat them eat them and eat the other caterpillars. This chickadee here on the bottom needs 3,000 caterpillars to sustain a nest every year. That's a lot of caterpillars. And if we don't have these particular plants and we don't have those caterpillars, we can't feed the birds. If we don't have the birds and higher predators don't have eggs to eat. So if you take out one thing, the whole thing kind of starts falling down. And milkweeds are homes to tons of other insects. I have a book, I didn't bring it today, but there is like a field guide on just all the animals that you can find on milkweed. And it's just like this huge book of all these things. That's like, okay, it's not just for monarchs, but super cool of all the other things that live there. So they're important because they're part of that food web. Take one thing out, we have no idea what else will collapse with it. So action, what can we do? The biggest thing that I think is the easiest thing that no matter what age you are, young or old, you can tell people about it. Spreading the word and being like, hey, did you know about monarchs and milkweed? That does so much. Just getting the word out there, getting support, getting understanding, knowledge leads to appreciation and protection. So that's huge. Other things are planting native plants, including milkweeds, but also butterflies, once they're adults, they need nectar sources. So any kind of native flower that provides nectar is also a huge bonus. 
And then there are other things on this list. Um, the big push, so I updated this whole presentation uh, because the what to do has changed from when I first saw it. What they're pushing now is to join citizen scientists' efforts to track wild populations. At the beginning, I said we'll talk about raising monarchs. The first push when we saw that first map of all that data and they were crashing was raise them indoors, protect them from predators, and we'll release them. Well, new research has come out that that might not be what's really helping them. But now they want us to like look at what's happening in the wild. So those are the big push, and there's different websites. This is um, the North America Monarch Institute, and it counts Canada, North America, and Mexico. Because the problem with monarchs is they go through three different countries. Not just different states, but countries. So this organization is a tri-national monarch organization that is working together through different countries, plus farms, businesses, and homeowners. You can also donate to different monarch conservation. You can go to different educational events um, at the Forest Preserve. We have all sorts of programs about monarchs. I'm doing a monarch thing um, in July. We have festivals um, and different organizations have all that kind of stuff. So again, it's just kind of getting that word out um, and using nature friendly products in your yard. So this is when I know I harp even on my mom, like, do you really need to use that chemical <laughs> that you're spraying um, to get rid of the weeds? We use a lot of pesticides, but that tends to get everything else gone. It hurts the native plants, it hurts the insects. So using there's different alternatives, using natural products. Even keeping our water bodies clean helps. You know, making sure, and it's almost, you know, people are like, well, I don't litter. But you may not litter in a forest preserve if trash ends up on the road with wind and how runoff works, it ends up in our waterways. And if it ends up in the waterways, it ends up all over the world. So that's always a good one to protect anything. And then kind of supporting different communities and the sanctuaries that they're at, and then supporting milkweed. Because milkweed has kind of a press problem because it's called a weed. <laughs> but it's not a bad weed. It's a beautiful one. There's tons of different kinds. So I put four on here and I do have handouts. I have handouts of uh, different places you can go to get information about milkweed and then different uh, species types that are good for your yards. So there's all different colors, different types, different habitats for them. If you have a wet area, there's swamp milkweed. Um, if you have a drier area, there's prairie. This orange one is in huge demand because it's probably the most well-behaved of the milkweeds. It grows maybe the highest to your knee and it's these beautiful orange flowers and it kind of sticks where you put it. I hear a lot of people are like, oh, but that milkweed, it goes everywhere. <laughs> Common milkweed can be a little aggressive. Once you put it in, it can grow and grow. So if you have the space for it, totally plant common milkweed. If you have a yard and a landscape that you want to keep with your pretty flowers, there's other options. Milkweeds get their name from, anyone have any idea? Why are they called milkweeds? Exactly, same picture. I'm picturing like just taking one of those leaves off and then it droops the milk sap. And that's what makes those caterpillars more toxic. It keeps the butterflies toxic. So it's a very particular um, stalk of plant. They have kind of opposite leaves and then you break them off, it goops a little bit. And I do have milkweed seeds for you guys to take and they are the butterfly weed, which is that's usually the number one requested milkweed that we have. Um, and they are just starts of seeds. So what I recommend for people, because starting them can be pretty taxing. <laughs> it may not always work. And they have instructions on the, the packets, but I have tried many of times to put them in our nature center. I dig a hole and I do it here. We put them in the refrigerator to get the germer, the, uh, uh, you have to like cut them to get the, it to germinate, I guess. And again, it has instructions on there. None of it worked. I gave it to my toddler program for three to five year olds they planted them and they grew it's like okay so toddlers can do it <laughs> so what we found is that if you just sprinkle them without putting digging a hole like a traditional seed sprinkle them on top of the soil you can kind of pat them down in case you know birds or wildlife will mix with them and then the timing milkweeds will that flower head turns into a seed pod and they burst open and they have that light fluffy cotton that drifts everywhere, that's the time to plant your seeds. So it's usually fall, you can sprinkle this seed packet, or you can wait in winter, that's when the forest preserve plants a lot of our seeds. We put it on top of the snow. When the snow melts, it brings it to the soil and it provides it with the water. They do well in the cold and will germinate from the next season. So don't necessarily plant it, the seeds now, you have to wait to the right season. 
But if you're like, but I want some now. It is summer, we need flowers. We have a Summer Blooms native plant sale um, with the Forest Preserve District of Will County. It's hosted by like our friends organization. So they're the Nature Foundation of Will County. You can order online until July 10th and then pick up your orders on July 23rd or 24th. You can also go in person because sometimes I'm terrible with online stuff and I just want to see the plant right in person. They'll have volunteers there to talk to you about like what kind of yard do you have? Do you have a dry spot, wet spot? What are you looking for? And they can point you to the right direction. Um, and it's at our Isle of Cash Museum in Romeoville. So if you're interested in native plants, and it doesn't have to be just milkweed, remember the adult butterflies need nectar as well. There's lots of different options to put native plants in your yard. And that's like the number one thing you can do to protect any wildlife, to help anything in our area is to plant these plants that were made for our area. And what's great is well, once they're planted, they come back on their own. They don't really need water. They're like made for our Midwest crazy weather and they just keep on coming back. So you plant them once and you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> okay, so then it gets me to, what about raising monarchs? Uh, Cause at the beginning of all this, that was the answer to, say only eight of those babies, eight out of 400 survive, well, let's make sure more survive. Well, since 2014, we've done a lot of research and we found that it's not really helping because we're raising them inside. Inside, we have beautiful air conditioning on. So they get outside and it's like, what is this heat? <laughs> you know, um, they can also transmit diseases to each other. So even we were raising like 200 at a time. That is a lot of caterpillars intermingling in one little case. I'm like, okay, I get it. Um, people were ordering them from labs, you know, to like release at their weddings and graduations and stuff. Well, when you order it from a lab, now you're losing genetic diversity. And remember how important that migration generations work, that you need those genetics so they know where to fly. Um, and catching them and releasing them in different populations. And that goes for any animal. When someone's like, I want to relocate an animal, it tends to be a bad idea. They don't know where they are. They don't know where the food is. They don't know where to hide from predators. They don't know where to overwinter. So that in general wasn't a super great idea. And then with the scientific research, they're finding like, well, how much wild do we have? You know, we have these released ones, but we have no idea how many we have actually in the wild. So to get those numbers that we need, we need to know what that is. So they still say if you want it for education, to bring awareness, to bring appreciation, if you want to do it, you know, for the grandkids or for the family or just to have fun in your own house, you can still do it in small numbers. So with that, I have kind of the best practices because it has evolved. So the first thing is to never order from a lab company. If you want to do it, try to find it in your own yard, in your park. You can't take anything out of the forest preserve. That is illegal, so don't do that. But if you have it somewhere on private uh, land, you can kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, you want to raise small numbers, so no more mass raising of these animals anymore. And then try to just do it in the one generation. And again, this is just to kind of help the genetic diversity and to make sure um, that we're not kind of affecting all those generations. And then the big thing is keep them outside. So all of my containers and my tank now gets outside because they orient with the sun and I have seen a difference. Um, anytime I kind of had them like underneath the porch and when a butterfly hatched, they went immediately to the sun. Like that, they're seeing the time cycle. So very cool. And then make sure you clean the containers often. They do poop a lot. If you're eating and eating and eating, they make frass is what their poop's called. So you want to make sure you clean that up and sterilize any jars, keep it all clean to help with the diseases. So if you want to do this, first you need milkweed because that's the only plant they eat. So if you have, if you have any hopes of finding a caterpillar, you got to have milkweed to feed them. Uh, you need a container of some sort. It could just be a jar with a stock on it. Uh, we put ours in like a reptile cage with a door. I've seen those like uh, bounce. They're like almost the laundry basket things that have little mesh and they kind of go up and down. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you could do it. You need to keep an eye out for the caterpillars. Again, we're not ordering them. We're seeing them in your own yards. And then once you have them, you can put a whole stock of milkweed in that jar. I've done many versions of like, here's a singular leaf, and that leaf dries out super quickly. We've done just a bunch of leaves in the jar, super dry out quickly. So if you have a lot of milkweed, you can put a whole stock in there and they'll eat it. And then clean and refill as needed. So again, re this is a month long commitment <laughs> if you're starting from a little baby all the way to an adult. So another tip is 
realize if you're going on vacation, if you're going out of town for a weekend, you're going to need a babysitter because they're going to constantly need eating. All right, I threw a lot of information at you. With that, do you have any questions about monarchs, about milkweed, about native plants? Anything at all? Um, yes? After milkweed establishes, will the same plants keep come back year after year? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so once you get those roots in the ground, they'll come back in that same spot and then they'll start migrating in other spots. So depending on what species you have, like that common milkweed will just kind of take over a little spot. <laughs> Sun, sun. Yeah, they're prairie plants, so generally they need full sun. And I say generally because depending on your yard, you can get away with. I live in like a condo and I have a deck over my one plot that I have for my, it's my pollinator plot. And so it has little sun, but then it's shaded for the most of the day. It still grows. It may lean to find the sun, but it grows. And I did have a caterpillar on my plant and I basically live in a parking lot. And it's just like amazing that one plant no matter where it's at, can still bring nature to your own yard. Any other questions? Concerns? All right, so with that, oh, you got one? So do you do experiences? I mean, do you see monarchs on your milkweed all the time? Yeah, I have just the one butterfly weed, and last year I saw a caterpillar, and I was like, oh, this is so exciting. No, I did not see it all the way to adulthood. <laughs> So I, I hope it just kind of moved on. Um, so I have seen that just in my little, like, it might be the size of this table is the spot I have. So I have some milkweed and then I have other native plants. I have coneflower and I saw an adult monarch on the coneflower. I saw finches eating the seeds. And again, it's just this tiny little plant. Um, but my neighbor lives in a traditional house and unincorporated. So she's got these huge yards and she has a ton of common milkweed and they're just all over. We just looked the other day and there's maybe six eggs along her house that we're going like, to keep an eye on to see if we can track and follow where they go. So they do come and some people ask like, well, how do they know where the milkweed is? And they think it has something to do with the scent. They can smell the plant. You can imagine if it's got that sticky staff and it's got those big flowers. I mean, it's got to be very, even if we can't smell it, the insects can. So they can find it if you grow it. <laughs> Right, they find Mexico and they've never even been there. Their great great grandparent was there and somehow they still find it. It's just, it's amazing. Nature is just super amazing. Anything else? All right. Well, with that too, we have, um, I brought different things to take home with you. And in the lines of what we talked about today, everyone can take some seed packets home. And this is of that orange butterfly weed. Um, then I have different milkweed handouts. So there is websites on if you want more information about pollinators, about monarchs. And then when you have a fun native yard, and when I say native yard, when you have your favorite plants like peonies, you don't have to get rid of everything and start over. Just start adding more native things. And when you do, there's different companies that will give you like a sign that says, I have a monarch way station. So again, it's just another way to bring awareness to even your neighbors, to your family and friends. Like, what's that about? And you're like, well, because I planted all this milkweed, my yard is officially a monarch way station. I tried to grow a, a butterfly garden one time. Mm -hmm. And I, I bought a couple of plants and tried to get them to grow. How to work? Yeah, it worked for so so. You know? So so. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then I have another one that has more of that milkweed. So I was saying that one picture that had all the different kinds: butterfly milkweed, swamp milkweed, prairie purple, common. Um, and then it tells you a little bit more. A lot of people are worried about when they plant milkweed. Have you seen the aphids? The little yellow like they look like punk rockers. They're like little yellow dots, but they have like spiky hairs all over. Um, it kind of talks to you what they are. And they're fine, they're natural, they're part of the system. Ladybugs eat them, um, part of the food chain. So that kind of explains to you like, no need to worry, it's all okay. And then these other ones, again, the monarchs are just the, the cover children, you know. Um, a lot of other pollinators are bees, butterflies, beetles, ants, even wasp, which I know is a hard one to love, they pollinate things too. So I have different, if you wanna know like, well, she keeps on saying native plants, what kind of plants are we talking about? Here's the full list of things. This is trees and shrubs and then perennials of sun, full sun, shrubs, low canopy, high canopy, 
Um, the color it will grow, the moisture it needs, the height it will grow, when it blooms. These are really awesome when you're thinking about like, okay, what plants do I need to learn about? These have it all. And then if you want a copy of today's presentation, I have printouts of that as well. And then along with just the forest preserve, we have maps of every Will County forest preserve, except that new one I just talked about. Haven't updated that yet. And then our big summer program is food and fun food trucks. Uh, we used to do them every Friday. Now they've changed dates a little bit and they've become bigger. So there's more vendors, more food. There is now beverage trucks. I think one is a margarita. So could be fun in the summer. And then I have, um, we got cards for the buzz. If you want to share with your family and friends, whew, let me just chuck it at you. You get a card and you get a card. Um, this has a QR code, so it sends you to our Facebook and our YouTube pages. So if you want to check out more about Will County Wildlife, again, we cover everything. If you have questions about the Sandhill Cranes, we covered it. If you have questions more about butterflies, we talk about it. So there's a little bit of everything in there. And with that, that is our Monarch and Milkweed presentation. I have a question about yes. The four rivers. Mm -hmm. Been to a raptor program Okay, yeah, they bring in the birds. Right. Are they coming back? Uh, they host, so they have a few things. Four Rivers Environmental Education Center is in Shanahan. They're actually going through um, a renovation. So they are putting more exhibits in there. They're getting a huge fish tank. They're making an all persons trail that's paved and has different, you know, touchy feely things and interactives. And a lot of that, too, is with their programming. So they're having a migration celebration, or I think they just passed. That usually for the raptors is for the Eagle Watch every January. That's annual. And then they do that pelican pursuit I was talking about. So they will be back, but I think they only come for the Eagle program. Um, they might have been there for migration celebration because their, their theme is kind of birds and then four rivers, they're right on the waterways. So they talk about how migration and the rivers are highways and the birds and that's kind of their niche. So they do a lot of those kind of programs. It's really fun. We all kind of have niches. So that's theirs. Um, we have the History Museum up in Romeoville. Uh, Moni Reservoir is more recreation based. So if you want fishing, if you want to run a boat, um, we do kayaks, rowboats, pedal boats, all that good stuff is there. And then Plum Creek Nature Centers and Beecher, and they are like your whole family uh, connecting people with nature, nature centers. So a little bit of different things for everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Dryad works to improve the quality of life for seniors by providing an opportunity for the exchange of information between public safety, social services, and seniors. There are no membership papers to fill out or fees to pay. Everyone is welcome to attend. Each month, we present a guest speaker on subjects that keep you informed and up-to-date on the latest scams, frauds, and other criminal activities. We also discuss safety issues, home preparedness, and staying healthy. Triad meets the fourth Thursday of every month. Contact the New Lenox Police Department at 815-462-6100 for more information.